Minesweeper. The goal is deceptively simple, just find all the mines. But one wrong move, one tiny click, and it's over. This is how I made Minesweeper using just redstone. I hope you enjoy. In case you've never played before, let's go over the rules. Minesweeper is played on a board of square cells. Underneath some of these cells is a mine. If you open all the cells that don't have a mine, you win. But if you open a single cell with a mine, you lose. So to start the game, pick a random cell to open. This creates a chain reaction that opens up a bunch of cells automatically. You'll notice that some of these cells have a number on them. That number tells you how many mines are around that cell. Or in other words, how many mines are in the eight neighboring cells. So if the mines are like this, it would be three. And if the mines are like this, it would be five. Now, if you think you know where a mine is, you can put a flag on the cell. You don't have to use flags to win, but it's extremely useful. So let's try to win this game. Right off the bat, I see a one right here with only one closed cell around it. That means it must be a mine, so let's flag it. And now that we know that's a mine, we know that it must be the mine that this one is referring to. So all the other closed cells around it must be safe, and we can open them. Following this logic, you can keep opening things up all around the board, flagging all the mines as you go. Eventually, you'll have opened up everything that's not a mine, and you win. So how did I make this with just redstone? Well, the first observation I made is that every cell follows the same rules. Of course, different cells might display different things, but you wouldn't expect one cell to follow a different rule than any other cell. In that way, all cells are the same. So in theory, you can just build one cell and duplicate it to make any size board you want. Okay, but what is this cell gonna look like? What type of logic does it actually need? Well, first of all, a cell needs to be able to show 12 different things. Two of them are when the cell is closed, because it could either be flagged or not flagged, and the other 10 are when the cell is open. It could be a mine, it could be a number 1 through 8, or it could be blank, which is essentially the number 0, because a blank cell means there are 0 mines around it. Unfortunately, showing colors on a Minecraft display is a bit of a hassle. There are ways to do it, like using maps, but I didn't really want to get into that. So I designed these 12 patterns using just redstone lamps. When the cell is closed, all the lamps are on, and if you flag it, the flag is shown in this inverted fashion. Then when the cell is open, all the lamps are off, and if it has a number or a bomb, the lamps just get turned on to show it. So yeah, not the prettiest display in the world, but at least it's just redstone lamps. And honestly, after making some mock displays of what the game would look like, I was pretty happy with it. So once I decided on these patterns, it was time to start making some actual redstone. And for this, my first goal was to make a display module to help show these patterns. Specifically, I wanted to make a circuit that would convert a signal strength value to a pattern. Naturally, I decided to map signal strength 0 through 8 to the patterns for 0 through 8. Signal strength 9 was mine, 10 was flag, and anything 11 or higher was closed with no flag. So this is what my first attempt at that circuit looked like. I was trying to make it kind of like a 7 segment display because I thought to myself, well, most of the patterns are just numbers. But you can't really show a mine with just 7 segments. I mean, you kind of can, but it's not great. So I decided to change to a pixel display instead, where I have individual control of every pixel. This made it easier to design a mine, and it also allowed me to make the numbers look however I want. The downside is that it got way bigger. I ended up having to use a bunch of torch towers, so the circuit got really tall. But it worked. The signal strength input is all the way down on the bottom, and as you can see, if we put in a 6, we get a 6 on the display. However, I should probably mention that I made some pretty big changes to the mappings. First, in order to make the display a little bit smaller, I decided to just not include the 8 pattern. If you think about it, the only way you could have an 8 is with a situation like this. And in this case, there's no way to know whether the cell in the middle is a mine or not. It's a 50-50 guess. Now, some versions of Minesweeper have a mine counter on the top, which could help you figure it out, but I didn't plan on building that. The other thing I realized is that flags are purely cosmetic. They're just a tool for the player. So I thought it was kind of a waste to assign an entire pattern to it. Instead, I just added a purple line up here, which hijacks some of the torch towers and forces them off. And that allows you to turn on the flag really easily, and it's completely independent of the signal strength. So after those changes, the final mappings looked like this, and the display circuit was complete. 
The next thing I thought about was the user interface. How is the player going to interact with the cell to play the game? This is a super important part of game design. Have you ever gotten frustrated or even quit a game because you couldn't figure out the controls? Luckily, in this case, the UI doesn't need to be super complex. I mean, this game was meant to be played with just a mouse. So I thought the easiest way to do it is to have two note blocks for the player to click. The left one is to open the cell, and the right one is to flag the cell. Technically, the UI also needs a reset button in case you want to play a new game, but that doesn't need to be on every cell. There can just be one reset button for the entire board. Then, after I made this UI and I was happy with it, I started to hook these signals up. Hooking up the flag signal was pretty straightforward. It just needed to toggle the purple line between on and off. So I used a sticky piston and a redstone block to create a T flip-flop. And as you can see, the note block will now toggle the flag. But then for the open signal, the functionality got a little more complicated. So let me switch to a simplified view to help explain this. Okay, so this is our cell. Here's the open signal, here's the flag signal, which goes into the T flip-flop, and here's the signal strength input for the display. Remember, this works according to a mapping. So if you put in a 9, for example, the cell shows the closed pattern. Now, for the open signal, I knew that a T flip-flop wasn't going to be a great choice. Because once you open the cell, you shouldn't be able to close it, right? It should be permanently opened until a new game. So a better fit for that logic is an SR latch. When the player opens the cell, it sets the latch, and it stays set if they try to open it again. The only way to close the cell is to send a reset. But the other thing I had to think about is how to connect this latch to the display. And I'm kind of proud of myself because I came up with what I think is a pretty clever way to do this. To show you what I mean, imagine for a second that this cell has three mines around it. I know we haven't done any mine counting yet, but just bear with me for a second. Since it has three mines around it, you're going to want to put a three into the display so that it can show a three. But that three should only be shown once the cell is opened, right? So if the latch hasn't been opened yet, I made it put a high signal strength into the display. That way it overwrites the three and according to our mappings, it'll show a closed cell. Then once you open the cell, it's no longer overwriting the signal strength of three and now it will display a three. So yeah, I don't know about you, but I thought that was really cool. And that's actually why I made the mapping for the closed pattern the highest signal strength because it allowed me to just override the smaller ones until the cell is opened. At this point in the process, I was really happy with how things were coming. I was only about 6 hours in, and I could already flag a cell, open it, and show any number you want. But this is where it starts to get interesting, because the next thing I tackled was mine counting. Mine counting is probably the most important part of building Minesweeper. It's the idea of using a circuit to count the number of mines around a cell and display that number. At first glance, this seemed really simple, and if you were writing this in code, it would be. It would probably just be a for loop. But in redstone, this circuit can get really messy really fast. I mean, if every cell needs to check all of its neighbors for a potential mine, that means you need a wire between every pair of neighboring cells on the entire board. That's a lot of wires. Luckily though, this wasn't my first time making a circuit like this. Back in 2021, I made the Game of Life, which involved a similar neighbor counting circuit. So let me show you how I adapted that and kind of applied it to Minesweeper. The main idea behind a counting circuit is actually based on a comparator trick. If you didn't know, a comparator on subtract mode will calculate the back value minus the side value. If I have 8 minus 3, it shows 5. So this circuit right here is where the magic happens. This is what I used in the game of life. It uses comparator subtraction to count the number of signals that are on. For example, if I turn on 3 levers, it gives a signal strength of 3. This works by starting at signal strength 15 and subtracting 1 every time a lever is on. So you can see that it starts at 15, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, and it ends up at 12. And then at the end, it does 15 minus that 12, which gives you back the 3. So I knew right away that I could probably just repurpose this circuit to count the mines. But I struggled a lot on the wiring. After a few hours of trial and error, I was pretty frustrated. But I didn't give up, and eventually, I found a layout that works pretty well. The trick for this wiring is to use the third dimension. Instead of making the comparator line in a straight line or a square, I made it in a spiral going up and down. That way, I could focus on just a few neighbors per layer instead of all eight at once. So here's what the final mine counting circuit looks like. The inputs for the mines are on the bottom, 
and the mine counts are on the top. Every cell is using this spiral pattern to do the counting, and if you actually walk down the spiral, you'll notice that it only checks for two mines on every layer. First it checks these two, then these two, then these two, and then these two. So let's try this out. If I put a mine in all four corners, it outputs a four in the middle, that makes sense, and a two in each of these cells, which also makes sense. If instead I put a mine in just the center, then every cell on the outside is a one. Pretty cool, right? Once I had this working, the next step was to just hook it up to the real cells and try it out. And when I hooked this circuit up and tried mine counting for the first time, something incredible happened. It worked first try, no joke, that never happens. And now, after just 15 hours of work, I could flag cells, open cells, set the mines on the bottom, and it shows the correct number once you open them. So it's safe to say I was really happy. But that happiness did not last long. It's time to talk about zero spreading. This is the hardest part of any Minesweeper build. I've literally had multiple people message me saying, hey, I'm building Minesweeper. Can I get some help with zero spreading? So what is zero spreading? Remember in the beginning of the video when I showed you how opening the first cell creates this kind of automatic opening? Well, that's not random. That happens because of zero spreading. The idea is that if you open a blank cell or a zero, there are no mines around it. So instead of having to open all eight neighbors manually, the game will automatically open them for you. And if any of those cells are blank, it'll automatically open those neighbors too. And it'll repeat this until it spreads as far as possible. Now, I do want to point out that this is technically a convenience feature, just like flags. You don't need zero spreading to play or even win the game, but it makes things way faster, and to be honest, it looks really cool in a showcase, so I was very set on including it. When I pulled out the redstone and tried giving it a go, I was expecting it to be really difficult. But to my surprise, it ended up being actually kind of simple. You see, thanks to how I made my display mappings, the only time a cell is opened and blank is when the signal strength is exactly zero. So you can detect this with a single redstone torch. If this torch turns on, we know the mapping is zero. Therefore, the player just opened a blank cell. And then from there, all I had to do was just wire the signal from that torch to open all the latches of the neighboring cells. And the beautiful thing is, if any of the neighboring cells are blank, then their torch will turn on and it will continue to spread. So yeah, I was scared over nothing. I think the reason it was intimidating was just because it looks really complex when you watch it happen. In reality, it was just a simple rule creating a complicated looking pattern. And after a few more hours and another set of spirals, zero spreading was fully implemented. At this point, I wished I could call it done, but there was one more arguably necessary feature. You see, as the game stands, if you're not paying attention, you might not actually realize you won. And if you're really not paying attention, you might not realize you hit a mine and lost. So I needed to make a circuit that would check for a win or for a loss and tell the player so that they know. To help me make this circuit, I started by drawing a truth table to help me visualize the different states of a cell. A cell can either be closed with no mine, closed with a mine, open with no mine, or open with a mine which gave me four cases to think about. So first, I thought about how to detect a loss, because it seemed like the easier one. And it was. There's only one case where the player loses. It's when the cell is opened with a mine. So that can be detected using an AND gate, which only outputs true when both inputs are true. Furthermore, if this AND gate is true for any cell on the board, you lose. You don't have to open all the mines at once, you just have to open at least one. So I put all the AND gates into an OR gate. That way if any of them output true, you lose. Then I thought about detecting a win, and I realized that there's actually two cases for a win. Either the cell is not open with a mine, or the cell is open but doesn't have a mine. So this can be detected using an exclusive OR gate, or an XOR gate. An XOR gate will output true when either condition is true, but not both. And importantly, this condition needs to be true for every cell on the board, not just one. So I put all the XOR gates into an AND gate, that way every single XOR gate needs to output true in order to win. And that's all the logic you need for lose detection and win detection. Putting in that logic went really smoothly. In just 15 minutes, I had a lamp for when I won, and a lamp for when I lost. But two lamps is pretty tiny, I wanted to make this look better. 
So I built a giant face that smiles when you win and frowns when you lose. Unfortunately, this means that most of the time it's just sitting there emotionless, staring you down. But I don't know, I thought it was kind of funny. After that, I tested a few games and everything mostly worked. I did run into a small issue with flags. Turns out it's harder to reset a T-flip flop than I thought. And I had a few other minor things, but overall, I was amazed with how well it came together. Now, I also tried to make a mine generation circuit to essentially create a random game for you to play, but it was difficult to guarantee that the game wouldn't have any 50-50 guesses. So I gave up and I actually went with an easier route. Well, easier if you know Python. I created a Python script that will convert a board from this website into Minecraft. So you can generate random boards or you can make your own and you can import them directly into the game. If you're interested in using this script, I'll put more info in the description. But remember, you don't have to do that. You can also just use the levers on the bottom to set the mines. And so after writing the script and throwing a little more decoration on the game, I officially called it done. I'll see you in the showcase. If you made it this far, that probably means you liked the video, so why not subscribe? And if you'd like to support me, I have a Patreon page in the description. I also have a Redstone Discord server, so come join us if that sounds interesting. I hope you learned something, I hope you enjoyed. Peace out guys.